single pixel camera then goes through each pixel and then determines a score whether it's zero, negative one, or plus one. And then it just kind of compresses and normalizes the JPEG down to the small format. Well, so th this is all the this is all the pixels, but I'm at, I'm taking one one reading, one measurement. One measurement is described by this random mask xi, and I'm going to do this t times, right? So this random mask xi is going to output one measurement y. Um, so this is my measurement. So I take a whole image, and you can think of having the full image, and then taking, doing a random mask to it, and you output one measurement. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll actually, you can think of this actually as the image as this one vector. And so let me go through an example with an actual vector. Okay, so how this works. So your input is going to be a signal S, right? So and what we what we need for this to work is that S has to be sparse. Um, so mathematically, this will work out. You can think of if you compress it to a small number of, um, of a small size, there's some compression in here. And when you think of in a binary vector, this corresponds to it being sparse. Um, so what that means is that it's going to be mainly zeros um, with a few ones um, that are sprinkled in here. Right? So sparse means um, um, mostly zeros. And then there are some things that aren't, aren't zeros. Um, yeah, from a storage perspective, perspective, those zeros, they don't really count, right? Or, or maybe this is tangential, but... Um, that's actually the point, right? Yeah, so in the, in the JPEG, I just need to store the locations of the ones, right? In the 10 megapixels I am calculating, I'm storing all of the zeros as well. Right, so, so, so that, that the analog here is I want to just store the locations of the ones um, in my compressed format, but you know that sensing it checks and it, most of the sensing says that's just zero, right? There's nothing there. It's like looking under a bunch of cups and, and there's one one of them has a key under it, right? And you keep, need to keep looking. And most of them are useless. So you just want to store the location of where the the prize is, okay? And so that's going to be these small number of ones. Okay. And so then what this this measurement this mask is. Um, so, so this is going to be a um, this can be a mass xi, and so this is going to be a random vector of the same length here. Um, so, say this is a so the size of s will be m, right? Um, and so, so x will also be a, a length m, and x will be filled with minus one zeros. Um, uh, so, let's say plus one. All right, so at random, I'm going to put in minus one, zero, or plus one for every coordinate. OK? Um, and so then I'm going to output the actual, um, um, the, the actual measurement yi is going to be um, the dot product of x and xi. So I'm taking, and that's exactly what this random mask is doing. You've got this, think of this as a long vector, you're taking the dot product. That's what, that's what a mask is. So the dot product, you're summing, so the, the, you know, um, th this is equal to, you know, uh, zero times minus one plus zero times zero. You know, you, you're adding all these things up, and occasionally, you're gonna get a one times one. You know, so you're going to have a small number of things out, and the signal will be pretty small. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be on the order of maybe square root of the number of ones, right? So it's probably going to be between minus square root k and plus square root k if there are k ones. So for k ones, um, then then th th this is probably going to be um, usually in minus two square root. To, to um, just by if you look at the turnoff Hawking bound, you can get you can kind of understand why this is the case. Okay. 
But th this, this range doesn't matter so much. There will be some small number. So in this case, it might be 2. Right? So this will be the measurement. Okay, and so, so remember, you're going to do this for t times. And so t is going to be, um, uh, t is going to be uh, 20,000 20, in our case, right? Uh, yeah, but so th there's like a theoretical bound of, um, of some big constant times k uh, log of m over k. So, so this is the number of measurements you need. And, and this m, in most reasonable cases, is 4. And in the, the worst possible adversarial case, it's going to be like 20 is fine. So but the number of measurements you need is going to be about the number of ones times a log factor. Right, so it's going to be about this size. The log factor you need anyways because you need to store the location of the ones, and the location needs you to have this, this log m here. It's actually log m over k because there are tricks to storing ones, right? You can store the distance to the first one, then store the distance to the next one, then store this distance. When the distances are shorter, you don't need a full log m. You need some, something smaller. So it's actually, so if you were to actually compress this, not just store the individual locations, but the distance between locations, which would be better, you still get this bound with, with some extra constant. So you really don't need a lot of, a lot of these measurements in, in order to get this. And there's this kind of magical threshold where if you're able to get this many of these random measurements, you can almost recover this exactly with some kind of, a, you know, probability that's, that's going to zero, you can almost completely recover this. It's almost like, it's like a linear algebra problem that you, if you solve correctly, then you can recover the right substance. It's, it's going to be like a well-defined one. Um, but because of the random noise, you can't guarantee you'll always do it. But in most cases, if you have this many measurements, you'll actually be able to actually recover all of these megapixels, meaning all of the locations of the ones. This is, is, when this came out, this was, you know, incredibly surprising. Um, so it was, was there, were, there were two kind of papers at the same time. There was um, Tao and Candace, um, and there's another paper by Donahoe. Um, and Candace was Donahoe's student, um, like maybe, he graduated like five or 10 years earlier. And Terry Tao is, is a, is a um, field medalist and, and math and had gallery on the field medal for something else. Um, so this was, I think, in uh, 2004. So this is, you know, still pretty recent, only like 10 years ago, that figured out you could do this. So, okay, so you had all these measurements, you have all these values y, you also know all of the maths that you use at x. You have to know these maths in order, in order to do this. Um, so you have this set of these random maps, and you have the output measurements, and you want to recover the signal S. Okay, so the um, compressed um, sensing um, is to go from this, this set X of all the maps, the vector Y of all the measurements, and you're going to get back the signal S. So we'll talk about a technique called lasso, which is pretty much the state of the art up to some. There are some modifications and you know things on top of it. Uh, we'll talk about that on Monday, which is also used for doing robust linear regression. Um, today I'll talk about a simpler way of doing this, um, which is one of the earlier algorithms that, that came out called um, orthogonal um, matching uh, um, pursuit, or uh, OMP. So this is going to be a simple greedy algorithm for, for trying to recover this. And it works pretty well. You can, 
You can prove some similar type bounds, and these are as good as you get with lasso, but there are other ways of looking at like the amount of noise you're allowed to have or, or the amount of kind of sparsity or noise that it's not quite as good for certain reasons. So it's not the state-of-the-art way to do it, but it's a very simple algorithm as well. And the algorithm can be used for other, other sorts of things or variations on it. So it's worth understanding this algorithm. Um, if you're going to try and implement it, um, you, you, know, you might try implementing this first, and if you had enough measurements, then this would just work. If sometimes if you have fewer measurements, this won't work, but the lasso or some other versions of the lasso um, are going to work. Um, so there's this really weird kind of threshold phenomenon with the number of measurements that you have. Um, so, okay. So let's try and describe this orthogonal matching pursuit algorithm. And so I'm going to use the index of this vector as j. And I, I denoted i for the each mask and each measurement. So I'm also going to have that, that xj is, is going to be a, is, what is this, going to be a, um, a, a column in, in x, whereas this was a row. So and we're going to find these xj will correspond to this, this j here. And so um, um, okay, so and so this 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 j in, in for instance in this mask, this j also is going to correspond with one of the elements of this mask. So you're going to think of having a whole matrix of these, and the xj is going to correspond to this whole column of these measurements. Okay, so this is going to be xj. Okay, so now I'm going to do this pre diagram, say for um, for uh, L equals 1 to T. So I'm going to construct, um, I'm going to try and construct back for, I guess, 1 to, 1 to K, these K once, so I'm going to have this this for loop, and this is going to be greedy. So I'm going to find one of these ones at a time, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to let um, let uh, j equals the r max of the dot product between x j and and y. Sorry, just to clarify. Sorry, uh, yep. just to clarify again. Good. So n is the size of s, right? And then k yeah. is just the number of ones that we found in s. So it's going to be correct. significantly like smaller than, than s. Right, right. So so k is going to be much. So um, so so think of s is going to be a million. So so think like or this ten million. million. This is ten um, million. And k is going to be equal to say 1,000. That might be a good setting. Okay, so you're going to try and find these k these k ones. Um, and so what you do is you find the the column in this mask corresponding to a potential location of a one that has the maximum dot product with one. So each of so that means essentially that if you take the dot product with, with y, the output, that means when the output tends to be large, or um, when the output tends to be large, then, um, then the then, uh, xi dot you know, s you know, was large. Now, the, now, it's, now you're saying that this term also tends to be large whenever y tends to be large. So if it was a zero in, in this case, even if there was a one up here, it's not going to matter. But if it is a one and y was large, then there was probably also a one up in s. Right? So that's why I'm taking the maximum thing here. So what this is doing is it's saying, what is the column corresponding to one of the elements of s 
which has the maximum explanation for the value of y. That's what this, this, this norm of the dot product is saying. How much, which of the columns can explain y the most? All right, and so I'm gonna initially set um, this, I'm gonna have this residual vector, which is initially gonna be equal to, equal to y. Um, and so then um, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, so it's, that's the one that explains it the most. Um, so what's the best way to, to explain it? So I'm, I'm then gonna set, um, um, gamma j equals r min of um, r minus x j. So I'm going to do the, this this like the least squares estimate. Uh, this should have been. Yeah. Right. So, so what's the, so this, this is my guess of the value of of this value S J. So, so this is S J. So this is my guess of the value S J. So I'm I'm minimizing. So this R was initially Y. So think of this as being the explanation Y. And I'm saying how close can I get to it by just varying this value. So, so by just accounting for this. So this was saying which one can account for the most, and this is how close can I get to the, the output. And then I'm going to say, okay, I've explained a certain amount of y, or whatever this, this residual was. So, this, so now I'm going to set um, r equal to r minus xj gamma. J. So this is, this is what I explained as good as I could explain it, this is what I had left of my signal, my signal that was, or not my, uh, my measurement which was coming out. And now this is, what's, this residual is now the part that's left. So I've explained part of, of what I saw, and this is what I haven't explained yet. And so that's it, and, and so then I go to the for loop. That's the model. So what happens now is once I've explained the first component, which was the, the closest, I go back and find all of this stuff, let's replace this with an R, of the part which is left, of the part which is left here, what's the next thing that that, that, that comes uh, that that has explained that? Right? So, that was, so maybe I'll say that S is initially you know, all zeros, and then here I'm going to set Sj equal to gamma j. Right, so I've set, I've set this here. What's the initial value for gamma? Uh, gamma is initially not set to anything. I solve for the optimal. This is the least squares problem, and I can solve the least squares problem. Right, by just, uh, what is this? It's going to be gamma is equal to. Uh, X tan plus X plus X I think it's something like this. I might be forgetting exactly. Things. But it's a least squares problem, so I can solve this exactly. So I so this I have to solve. This one I have to compute all these dot products and find the minimum. So this is actually another for loop hidden in here if you're not familiar this. I have to find this max. But it's, you know it's, it's a very simple argument. I'm greedily finding the the possible uh, bits of S which can explain my my random measurements the most. And I, I I take that one, then I factor out what that one explained. This is factoring out what this one explained, and then I of what's left, then I find the one that that explains that the best. And I and I just keep going and doing this until. Uh, you know, until k, where my k was my value, was my number of bits that I thought I was going to have. Or, or maybe, you know, you go a little bit past k just in case. Or you wait until gamma is small enough so that the, the, the thing you're recovering is pretty small. So you think that 
the expected value for this 0, 1, or maybe 0 or some non-zero thing, it's going to be a very small thing. That, then it's probably actually 0, so you want to stop. Right? So there, you know, when to stop this is, you know, is the same problem with the SVD. What, you know, how many of the, of the dimensions do you take? Right? So, so there are lots of ways you can choose when to stop, but you do this for some number of steps, and this pulls out what information is actually there. So, so does this, this make sense? Any of these steps are kind of confusing? You may still have some questions on your face. Um, I'm, just, you know, I'm just trying to formulate this today outside. <laughs> So that there, Mel mentioned a few other things you can layer on top of this to make this potentially a little better. Um, so this, this term here where I'm solving for gamma, I'm using the least square solution, right? But I mentioned uh, in the first lecture I did on the um, linear regression that I can, that you don't always want to use the least square solution. You can instead um, solve for, say, um, um, gamma j is equal to um, r in gamma in r minus xj gamma plus some um, s times uh, <coughs> times gamma. Um, and so if these are both the two norm, then this is ridge regression, and I can uh, I can just put a plus s squared inside of here. And I get this solution, which this is going to be um, more robust to noise. And you know, frankly, what you have here is you have a lot of noise. You want to use something that's more robust to noise. The one thing you can do, if you if you instead use something like the one norm here, then this will be closer to uh, on the last side, which I'll talk about next week. Um, another thing is you can say, if I know this is a binary vector, then I skip this step. Then I, then if it's binary, then you just always set this to one. And maybe you, maybe your stopping criteria is that if if you solve this and it's closer to zero than it is to one, then it's probably time to stop. You probably just uh, you probably messed up somewhere. And if you didn't mess up somewhere, then eventually this residual is going to be an all zeros vector. And you're going to completely explain it. But if you messed up somewhere, maybe it, it, you just get something that's pretty small. And you say, OK, I may have misassigned one of these ones here. Um, and now I can't quite explain this. Because it's a greedy algorithm, it's not going to guarantee it to work. This, the, 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 the proof that these will actually work is complicated. The last will be a little bit more complicated to Prove it can work as well. But um, okay, so also because it's greedy, you can make mistakes early on. You can make two sort of mistakes. You could pick the wrong value j just because the randomness happened to happen to have a problem where you know one of these things lined up with the y, but it should have canceled out, but for some reason it, it became too large. Um, if if um, if that's the case, then um, you want to be able to fix this. So instead of solving for xj here, you can think of solving for gamma j, and this is going to be equals to the, the, um, the vector gamma 1, gamma 2, up to gamma j. So you can, you can set this equal to the r <coughs> of gamma of, um, of, of the original vector y minus, um, let's say we're going to call this xj, um, um, or x uppercase j, um, oh, this was, this was so where, where this is all of the all of the columns that you found up to now. You, you, 
Pinker in this sense. So on the on the elf round through here, I guess this would be L. So these are all the columns that you think are going to be explaining things corresponding to all the bits. And you can resolve for all of these values <coughs> at once. This is still least squares formulation. So I can still solve for this using using this. Um, before, when I just did this once, these were these were actually vectors, and I didn't need to write this in vector form. Um, but now this is actually a vector. It's, it's L by um, it's L by T. If you've done L measure, if you've found L of the measurement location so far, this is L by T, and you can still solve <coughs> for a set a set of these gammas all at once um, through this least squares formulation. And you can also add in this term for this. Um, um, for this, doing this rigid regression, and then you put the whole gamma inside this norm here, but you still just put this in squared terms. So you can still solve for this. So you can resolve for all these at once. Now, this is going to take longer. This is solving for one dimension at a time is much faster than solving for resolving for all of them. Um, but this one will be a little bit more forgiving if you make a mistake. And what might happen is that you're going to set. Um, you know, one of these, one of the gammas that you find is going to be close to zero, and maybe you say, actually, I want to throw that out once I've resolved it for zero. And in fact, the first time through, this can actually happen. If you go through like ten steps, the first thing you found was the wrong one, and then you and then you find nine more of these of these ones, and then it could be that the maximum value here was one of the things you found already. Now you've you've accounted for the variation in that one by the other nine things you found, and when you factor those into this residual, then it says, oh, that first one you made that's that's not so helpful anymore. So then you can you can resolve for this instead of zero. So it, it will do some self-correcting on its own, but by solving for resolving for all of them, this will be a bit more. So, okay, so we, we finished a little bit. So that, 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 that was all I had, but I, let me see if I have any more notes I want to say. Oh, um, you can see that this will eventually, eventually converge. Um, you're, you can think of this residual as the amount of things you haven't explained yet. Um, and because you're finding the thing that reduces it the most, you're always reducing the norm of this residual as you're, as you're going through this. So it'll eventually converge to something that has a smaller and smaller residual. So even if it doesn't find the right thing, it's getting a better and better explanation of what's going on. So even if you don't have a sparse signal here, and you want to find the, the elements which are, say the, um, say, the elements here which are just the largest elements, which end up having the most explanation in your model. Or even if these masks weren't, weren't random, but these were actually certain measurements that you cared about that corresponded with the parts of the data that, that were important to you. Um, so then, then you can use this orthogonal matching pursuit to find the variables which are most explanatory. So, so you can also use it in that context. And, it's been used in variations of this have been used in all sorts of, say, machine learning to try and find which variables explain something the most. And you have lots of variables. Um, but it's, it's a very simple algorithm. You find the one that, the greedily find the one that seems to have the most explanation. You find the, the, the best guess of what this is. Then you factor this out and repeat. So it's you know, a very simple idea. So in fact, when you're when they're solving for the, the when, when uh, if you're actually solving for the SVD, now there's a computer linear algebra way of solving for it, um, you know, exactly up to uh, numerical precision, but you could think of solving it this way. You're finding the direction which is explaining the data in L2 sense the most, and then you factor that out. And because the sum of squared errors is, um, is you, can, you can add up the orthogonal 
components um, without losing anything, this, it gives you the, the optimal answer for SV. The greedy technique will not always be optimal in general, but it will give you a good, you know, it will give you a good, um, a good guess to start with. Um, okay, so, um, so th this is really, so I'll, I'll just mention one other kind of a, a few other applications of this compressed sensing. It's been a lot in kind of finding, so, you know, I, I talked about these things where your, your signal is this binary vector, right, but you really instead want to find the kind of um, the key features which are explaining something. And you think there are a sparse number of features which can make some sort of explanation. Um, and so adapting this to actually the single pixel camera requires some transformation of the problem a little bit. But so the single pixel camera is a kind of a toy example that maybe people care about. I think they've tried to use it for like the Hubble telescope because sending the data back and forth. Um, from outer space is uh, is really expensive, so this is a compressed way of, of, of sending instead of the raw data. Um, but one place that's actually found good uses is in um, um, like taking MRIs of kids, right? So if you've ever had an MRI, you have to sit in this machine for like you know at least ten minutes, maybe maybe half an hour, and try not to move. Um, and and so, you know, it's hard, hard enough for, um, just for you to sit there and not move, but for kids, they're squirming and this is like physically impossible, right? So you can't get kids to sit still, and so they can't take these MRIs at the same resolution with kids. They can only get them in there for a few minutes. So they apply this compressed sensing, te these techniques, to, um, to how they do the, the MRI. So instead of trying to sense these, these individual things in all these directions, they did these random masks uh, in some sense on these things and then recombined them with compressed sensing offline. And this is how they can do the, the, the best, uh, very quick MRI things for kids. Um, this is the current technology for that. Um, so this is one technique where this is, is actually worked. Um, so um, so it's, it's, it's a pretty cool um, technique. Um, Okay, so um, I guess we finish shortly unless you have questions. Um, the, uh, we'll talk about the lasso. I'll talk about mainly in terms of um, uh, 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 robust regression for, for high dimensional data. Um, but it's a similar thing where you're really trying to, you're going to try and reconstruct this, this least squares estimate, which is really how we solve for the regression anyway. So you want to solve this least squares estimate, all of the values of these gammas, and you want a sparse reconstruction of these gammas. Most of them are going to be zero in the output vector. So we're going to solve the L1 regression, so the answer will be sparse. And a way of, if you can contort it into the compressed sensing framework, this is basically giving that state of our technique. Are we going to get a chance to play around with OPN and uh, regression? Um, I think so, yeah. So if, if not, I haven't made that yet. I'll do it probably by next Monday. I'll try and get those. Okay.